Right folks, I'm jumping around rather a lot. I'm going to try and do another video now. It's to do with the Stupfields and Isaacson ancestors in the tree. I haven't listened to it. I've got no idea what's coming up. Um, it's probably one of those reflections and this once again it's going to take a bit of time coming through. It seems to have to go through this process because the gallery is very big and uh, it takes a while for it to turn up. What I should have done is come on. But this, this is all part of the thing. Oh here we go, look. Part 1, the notices of the Stutfels and Isaacsons and the British Library visit in 2007. Audio recorded by Sheila. So this was me. I went to the British Library to find this really old book that was written and designed by us, Isaacson. He was actually doing a bit of his own tree back then in the 18th century. He was a vicar. Um, there's lots about him, on just him on his own. Anyway, I've said here, in 2007 I went to stay at the London School of Economics Hall of Residence, uh, which I often did, and I used to use it as my base all the time because you had a fantastic breakfast. It's even better now, they've got all the Wi-Fi set up for free and everything. Um, it, the only sad thing, it used to be right next door to the Family Tree Archive place, but they moved it out to Kew. So, um, anyway, on this occasion I'm going off to the British Library. Um, I had to get um, proof of who I was, I had to have a photograph taken, all that sort of thing, before they'd let you in the door. And I had to make an appointment, I had to book, to get this very precious book out of the archives. Um, and it had to be, you know, handled with care, it was an old document. I'll probably describe all this in a minute, but this is me in 2022, just saying about um, this document written by Stephen Isaacson in the 18th century, which examines the Stutfields and the Isaacsons. Um, I would like to go back, and you can get a copy of this book, um, but I haven't got round to doing that yet. But anyway, here we have the video. Now, it might take a few minutes again come on we just see it when it the screen turns white that's when it plays now the one of the reasons I'm doing this is because for several years I wasn't able to see my audio pods I've, I've got a lot of them saved to disc anyway but there are a number that I ha hadn't got round to um, put into disc and I don't know whether they, I know that the Ancestry people do always keep the stuff. Um, even if their technology goes down, which is what happened with the Flash Player. The technology just went, it was full of bugs or something, they got rid of it. And they've got a different one now. Media U UI Viewer, it's called. Um, like I said, this does sometimes take a while for it to get going. This is why it's going to take me so long. So I'm going to put it on standby a minute, but this is to do with the Stupfils and the Isaacsons. As soon as the white screen appears, I will press the button. Um, once again, it's only about 11 minutes, 11 to 12 minutes in length. It was a great visit, by the way, to that, to that to archive. Uh, to handle that book, you know, uh, uh, with beautiful illustrations inside. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it was lambskin. can't remember what the cover was, but there was a load in it that I really would like to have purchased that book myself, to tell the truth, because there's so much detail in there. Some of it is in Latin, um, but it's the drawings as well, the illustrations that, that are inside and since I seen that book I've learned a lot more about the Stupfields and the Isaacsons you know since 2007 I've like come on massively so I don't know what this audio is going to I haven't played it in advance so I don't know what's going to be on it over and out for a minute right back on there's the white screen folks 
I'm not going to press. The story of the Isaacson and Stuckvilles begins now. Recently I went up to London and uh, visited the British Museum. We're in the manuscript room. I was able to read and study the notices of the Stuckvilles and Isaacsons, which over um, time I will reveal parts of the book. One thing I'd like to point out right away was um, an error in the notices of the Stuckvilles and Isaacsons where Anne Isaacson is stated as marrying a William Holden and she's stated as being um, the daughter of uh, Reverend Stephen Isaacson but she was actually the daughter of the Reverend John Isaacson of Burwell. Um, and uh, uh, our, uh, Anne Isaacson married um, uh, James Mason. So that's just one thing, because that's proved by the um, the, the marriage licences that uh, I've got a copy of. Um, so just that was just one small thing I wanted to point out, but it was very interesting to actually handle the manuscript and you know, which was um, produced by one of the Isaacsons who who actually put it all together. And um, it was a, a Reverend uh, Stephen Isaacson, um, a later Stephen Isaacson, who put that together in the 18th century. It was a maroon, maroon colour book with gold on it. And it's full of very interesting material within it um, and I should be quoting little bits and pieces at different times as I go along but not all not all on this recording um, <clears throat> I just want to go through some parts of the Isaacsons um, which is information I've gathered over time with the help of various people um, including the Foster family who provided some information as well. Um, the earliest traces of the Isaacson family seem to place them in Yorkshire. However, there were branches of the family in London by the mid-16th century, and there are definitely branches in the Cambridge and Suffolk area by the time of the English Civil War. Um, they could have been derived from also Scandinavia, you know, back in time. According to family records, the Isaacson family were originally merchants in the city of London, and the portraits of several are still preserved by their different companies. Stephen Isaacson's notices provide a great deal of detail regarding the, the later Isaacsons in the 18th and 19th century. Um, as far as I'm, where I'm um, concerned, um, going up from Anne Isaacson, who married um, James Mason, then we then go up to her father, <coughs> the Reverend Stephen Isaacson, and up through that way. According to the family records, Richard Isaacson was the son of William Isaacson of Sheffield, and could have been the Sheriff of London in the reign of Elizabeth, and Henry Isaacson, his son, was the author of a valuable system of chron chronology. Um, the ODNB has an entry for Henry Isaacson and here it states that Richard Isaacson and his son were connected with the Painters and Stainers Company of the City of London. There is no mention of Richard having been sheriff but this do does not mean that he wasn't. <clears throat> it is apparent that he was a wealthy man. He left Henry properties at St Catherine Coleman and St Donis, back church in London, plus the manor of Harding in Fifield and Willingdale. Henry Isaacson attended Pembroke College, Cambridge, <coughs> but did not take a degree. Like his father and his uncle, Paul Isaacson, he took up the freedom of the Painters Stainers Company, one of the London Guilds, 
He served as upper warden in 1625, 1629 and 1630 and as its master in 1633, 1639 and 1640. His work on chronology, the Saturna Ephemerides, 1633, was a 400 page folio which summarised the major political, religious and cultural events in Britain and the world since creation. <clears throat> Henry Isaacson was also known as a friend and biographer of Lancelot Andrews, Master of Pembroke College and Royal Chaplain. However, Richard and Henry Isaacson, although related, are not direct descendants of the Isaacson brothers who married into the Stutvilles. For this, we need to refer to Philip, the fourth son of Stephen Isaacson and Marcia Rogers. I mean, they are connected. They've got a common ancestor, which is William in about 1530, the Sheffield William, <coughs> where he has two sons and they go separate ways by the look of things. Um, so according to the notices, Philip Isaacson of Burwell in Cambridgeshire and his wife Anne had three sons, William, Philip and Stephen, and one daughter, Grace. Philip died in 1691. His will is still extant. In it he leaves <clears throat> my home stall wherein I, I now live with orchards, barns and malt houses and stables and a close that was lately purchased of John Cashburn to his wife. It goes on about his will <clears throat> quite a bit. But he does leave a silver sp cup to his grandson Philip and a silver spoon to his grandson Stephen who, who is my uh, great-grandfather several times back. To his younger son Stephen he leaves all the lands and houses unbequeathed arable land, pastures and fen grounds. <coughs> According to the notices Burwell, a third manor called the Manor of St. Omer in 1632 belonged to the Goodwin family and has since been in that of the Isaacsons. The probability is therefore that St. Omer was bought by either Philip Isaacson or his father Stephen. Philip Isaacson's youngest son Stephen married Mary Bridgman. And this is all going, all these people are in my tree by the way, that I'm mentioning here. And um, Stephen and Mary had 12 children, including five boys, John, Stephen, Philip, Thomas, William and Robert. Stephen died in 1736 and is buried at Burwell. And there'll be photographs of Burwell on uh, my tree as well. Stephen, having in inherited the majority of his father's estate, he was a wealthy man. From his will, it is apparent that he owns around 400 acres of land with several properties, including at least one manor house dotted around Cambridgeshire and Suffolk. In the will, Stephen Isaacson is referred to as a gentleman and the impression is that most of his land is rented out to local farmers. In the will, he generously divides up his land and properties amongst his wife and children. The lion's share goes to his wife to be handed on to his eldest son John at her decease. The youngest son Robert does well out of the will, receiving around 900 acres and the youngest daughter, Mary, inherits a manor house, St. Omer's. Another daughter, Hannah, gets £15 a year to be paid on the Feast of St. Michael. The two children come off least well from the will are Thomas, who receives 15 acres of sedge fen, plus £5, and the fifth son, William, who gets just £5. However, they've already been given some land before, I think, through marriage. Using these notices and information from various sources, we can piece together the following information about the lives and descendants of the sons of Stephen Isaacson. And um, this is with the help I've been given by um, the Foster family with putting this, some of this together. What happened was the Stutville family's name sort of died out really and a lot of Several of the Isaacsons married into the Stutville family. John Isaacson of Newmarket married the eldest, M Mary Stutville, 
and they had two children, John, who died unmarried, and Mary, who married a G. Barlow from London. The second son, Stephen, was admitted to Queen's College, Cambridge in 1715, and later became the rector of Freckenham. He is something like my times five or six great-grandfather, or it could even be times seven. He married Anne Headley, but she was actually a Stutville, but had been married previously. He was her third husband, actually. They had several children, including John, born in 1743, who became rector of Little Bradley, and, and also curate of Lid Lidgate. This John also had a son, John, who took up the same parishes. His son, John Frederick Foster, was tutor at both St John's and King's College, Cambridge, in the 19th century, and also rector of Freshwater in the Isle of Wight. So there's uh, a lot of connection with the church, with the family, and round about this time. The third son, Philip, married Elizabeth Stutville. They had one daughter, Elizabeth, who died unmarried. The fourth son, Thomas, married Eliza Niles of Chesterton. Thomas died in 1743. They had a son, Stephen, who married Elizabeth Isaacson, one of the daughters of Stephen Isaacson of Freckenham. They in turn had a son, Stephen, who married Martha Hassel from Milden Hall. Martha turns up in the 1851 census with her son, who is a coachmaker. Um, the tape will continue in a minute with the second episode. Um, I just hope this is some help. I might have to redo this tape. It's not easy um, always putting things down, actually. Right, let's just stop there, folks. That's a little bit. Uh, of course, there's a lot, lots more that I've discovered since. I've had to do lots of verification, which you must do with the process. Never just accept. You will make errors. It's common. It's not uncommon, I mean, to make errors. Um, and But the more research you do, things will clarify and you can make corrections and you know, things like that. Sometimes this does happen as a part of the research process. It doesn't go smoothly always. Um, and there's loads more on the Stutfields. There's just a mass of information that I have gained over the last 10, 12 years since that audio was done. Uh, my tree is enormous now. Um, I help other people. I it's It doesn't get any easier it doesn't get any smaller it gets bigger the further you back you go actually um, but we were very good record keepers uh, in the past and like I always say when you find a gatekeeper windows open when you find someone of significance there'll be loads and loads of data on them we were good at recording for power and control for ownership of land and for taxes William the Conqueror made sure of that when he, when he created the Doomsday Book. Right, over and out for a minute.